Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna try to fix some dead chips. I think everyone knows my dead parts bin because I love to throw bad chips in here. So I have lots of stuff to try this process on. So let's get right to it. Ah, the dead parts bin. I love this thing. People always ask me like, why do I keep these old chips? But I have to say, there's something cool about the fact that I know that I've fixed so many computers that I've ended up with all of these bad chips here, which in and of itself is kind of cool. But also maybe there's a way to fix some of these. And of course, if I had thrown all these out, I wouldn't have the opportunity to try, right? So first, I'm gonna pick out a selection of these chips here to see which are worthy contenders for attempting a fix. And these are the chips I've come up with for this little experiment. Now, starting from the left side here, we have four Commodore 64 ROMs. I think there's three kernels and one basic. We have eight PLA chips. We have seven SID chips. And then starting at the top here, we have three TED chips. This is the graphics chip, graphics and sound chip from the Commodore 16 and the Plus 4. Then we have two 8501 processors. These are also the processors from the Commodore 16 and the Commodore Plus 4. Um, these chips are extremely unreliable, as are these. And then here is the VIC-2E, the PAL VIC-2E, that's from my Commodore 128, the German Commodore 128. I recently had a mail call video where I replaced this with a chip a viewer had sent in and that fixed the computer. And then in the next row here, we have two 6510 processors. Well, one's a 6510, one is an 8500, which is sort of the slightly newer version of the same chip. They are interchangeable with each other. And then down here, we have two Commodore 64 VIC-2 chips. Now, even though all of these came out of my dead parts bin, the problems with these chips are kind of varied and they're not all just completely dead. Some of them have different types of faults. So the reason why the Commodore 64 is on the bench here, the ZIF 64, is because I went through and I tested all of these chips. Anytime it says BS here, it doesn't mean bull, you know what, it actually means black screen. And uh, because that's a really common fault on the PLA, and with uh, ROMs, processors, things like that, I just wrote BS when we're getting that. But there were some other interesting faults that popped up, and I would like to show you a few of those just as a comparison to see if this process actually changes anything when we do it compared to how it is now. So first I would like to start with PLA number six. So here it is, nothing special about it, but it does something interesting when you put it in the 64. I'm gonna replace the PLA in this machine. I currently have the plankton in here. And we'll pop in the number six PLA into the machine. There it is. And when I turn on the 64, let's see what we see. Okay, so it appears to be working, except for a problem. The computer successfully booted into basic without issue, but look at the text, it's just rainbow colors. So that means that there's something going on with this PLA where it's not mapping the color RAM correctly into the VIC-2 space or something to do with that. Let me try out this Easy Flash 3, see if it works. I mean, it might just get a black screen when I try this. Oh, it looks like it's actually working correctly. <laughs> so yeah, the, that's a strange failure mode. Uh, let me go into this. Okay, yeah, everything looks good. Okay, so <laughs> just sitting here, I was about to run Donkey Kong Arcade and slowly but surely, <laughs> we're getting sort of flashing, flickery colors until we have this very nice Christmas effect on here now, which, you know, isn't ter totally terrible looking, but it's certainly not normal operation on the 64. Let's just try Donkey Kong Arcade, see what happens. There was the rainbow for a split second. Oh, wow, you know what's gonna have to happen. Yep, ink bid dance party, even though it's got flickery colors and other issues. <laughs> it is interesting that this graphical screen here doesn't have any corruption whatsoever. It seems to only be in text mode, although 
Donkey Kong Arcade, that graphics splash screen, it was having issues. And I went to this version of Jiffy DOS, which is a hybrid with Dolphin DOS, and it shows a little rainbow on the startup screen here. And instead of the normal solid colors, we're getting this crazy effect. So I thought that was a little bit of an interesting look at this weird failure mode on this particular PLA, when all the other ones that I have here are just black screen. So this is the only one that does anything that's a little bit different. Now these here are the bad SID chips, and I actually have a couple that act really strange, and I want you to hear how they sound. So this is the number four chip, and I'll just replace my good SID with this number four, turn on the computer. Oh, we got a black screen because I forgot to put my PLA back in. Oops. Okay, so over to Adrian's tools, and we're gonna go to the SID tester, which I think if you watch my channel, you've heard this before. It just runs through a whole bunch of waveforms and modulations, and it's perfect for testing all of these SID chips. When I push number one, it should run through all the tests and you will hear all three voices just play through some normal tones. It'll say sine wave, triangle wave, square wave, things like that. And then there's some filter tests. So take a listen to how this sounds. So yeah, that sounds a little screwed up. That was the number four chip. And on my list here, I wrote that one down as just all screwy. So some of the examples of things you have are like this number one SID seems to work, except it has bad low pass and band pass filters. So regular voice playbacks of all three voices, it works actually fine. But then as soon as you go to use the filters, I think in this one, you don't hear any sound at all. So those filters are, are dead altogether. And then number two chip, you do hear all the sounds as normal, but it's super, super quiet. You have to turn the volume crazy loud and then you hear a lot of interference. So something's wrong on the output stage there. Uh, this one has really quiet output, but then it also has dead filters where when the filters play, you don't hear anything at all. So sort of screwy, that was number four we just heard. Number five here says bad V3, so bad voice three plus dead filter. So voice one and two work fine. But then it goes to use voice three, you don't hear anything, and then the filters are all dead. You don't hear any sound either. And then we have number six, which is all screw, which I'll play for you in one second. And then number seven is working, except it's extremely quiet again, just like number two. So let me pop in number six, you can hear what another all screwy one sounds like. Into the machine, power it on. Okay, that gave us a black screen for some reason, which is weird because it's, okay, that time it worked. That's weird. You hear nothing on voice one at all. Well, I hear just noise. Uh, wow, caused the computer to crash. Let's see if that works, but it did crash midway through. Okay, yeah, something's very wrong here with this SID in the computer. Yeah, I sort of remember having one of my bad SIDs where it would cause weird issues in the computer, not to mention it would sort of work sometimes, and then other times it just would completely have no sound or, or crash. And that's exactly what's going on right now. But the first time I ran through this, it sort of sounded like the number four one, except it was all garbled, like you'd have tones that were all over the place. So it was rather interesting, and unfortunately I didn't record it on my initial testing. All right, well, I've talked a lot about these bad chips and what's wrong with them, but I haven't talked about what I'm gonna try to do to fix these. And I'm sure everyone's been screaming at their screen, telling me to hurry up and talk about this. What prompted me to make this video and try this experiment was I got an email from Daniel Mantioni. He's the man who designed the GAL PLA project, which of course I focused and shown on this channel, where it's an easy to make PLA replacement for your Commodore 64 using very, very inexpensive parts from China, like a few dollars worth, and a PCB you can just get made uh, anywhere, and then you have working PLA chips. He told me he had been reading the Atari forums and saw a thread about people talking about reviving chips using a very unorthodox method, and it's baking the chips, as in, yes, baking them in an oven at high temperature. He actually went ahead and tried the method himself, just using his oven in the kitchen, and had some interesting but mixed results. So before I tell them to you, I want to try this out myself and see what kind of results I get with these bad chips. Because maybe 
some of these, maybe they'll come back to life or maybe none will come back to life. Who knows, right? It's definitely an experiment. So according to Daniel, the method that the people on the Atari forums used was they put the chips in the oven at 150 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And when they removed the chips, they let them cool, tested them, and they actually had some that seemed to start working again. So I actually use my oven in the kitchen for cooking food in, and I didn't really feel like putting computer parts in there, even though there's probably no danger. 150 degrees Celsius, about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's not gonna melt the chips or anything like that. But it still might release flux, residue, or who knows what in there, and I just decided I didn't wanna do that. So I hit up someone I know in Portland that happens to have one of these toaster ovens, and yes, this is a regular Black & Decker toaster oven that was originally designed for cooking food in, and has now been adapted with the use of uh, this microcontroller that takes over the heating element in here, not to mention a little servo that can crack this door open, and this is used specifically for reflow soldering. Now, the design of this little door and all this insulation in here is to allow precise temperature control. So you set up these profiles on the screen, and then that allows you to follow the appropriate temperature curves for doing exact reflow soldering. But what's really sweet about this oven is you just go into bake, I can hit edit, and I can set the temperature, say, to 150 degrees and the duration, and the oven will take care of that exactly. And because this thing will never be used for food again, it doesn't really matter if this thing releases a bunch of toxic chemicals inside of there and it will never contaminate the food. Also, what's pretty sweet is the original grate that this thing had has been replaced with this solid metal sheet or it's aluminum, and that way the ICs I put in here won't fall through and down into the bottom of the oven. So first things first, let's load up all these ICs onto the metal sheet so I can put them in the oven. I mean, this sounds completely ridiculous. Like, how is this possible that this is even gonna work? But maybe it will. That's why we're doing this experiment. I spaced out the ICs so they weren't all touching. And there we go, close the door. <laughs> there they are, little chips in there. They're about to bake. And currently the oven is 22.8 degrees inside. There we go, 150, 30 minutes. I assume I push this button here. Open after bake, close when cool, use cooling fan once baking is done. I mean, are these different options I can set? I'm gonna set it to use the cooling fan when done. And there we go, bake 150 degrees for 30 minutes. Start. Preheat. Oh man, I can't even believe it. On the screen here, the temperature is rising. It's uh, now 31 degrees and it's rising pretty rapidly, 32, 33. So it's, it's going up quickly. All right, now I just wait till it gets to temperature and then the 30 minute countdown will begin. So I came to check on this oven and uh, sure enough, the baking is done. It's counted down to zero and the servo has cracked open the door. So it's letting the heat out. The oven has dropped to about 81 degrees Celsius. So I will just let these chips cool all the way to room temperature before I test them. Here we are, the cookies are out of the oven. I mean, I'm just kidding, the chips are out of the oven. All of them have cooled completely to room temperature. So I'm gonna go through all of these, test them out on the 64 and of course the C16, see if these things work. Testing is complete and here are the results. So everywhere you see a red dot, that means that there was no change, no improvement. Basically, it had no effect on all of these chips. But take a look right here. I actually have one green check mark. That was a PLA that had a black screen and it now boots the computer, although it's not perfect, it has glitching color, which actually matches the number six PLA, which still works and is completely unchanged from before. But yeah, number four is working. This is how a working PLA looks on my system. 38,911 bytes, no rainbow text. So this is the number four PLA, the one that's seemingly fixed. I'll just pop this into the machine. And now when I power it on, as you see, it's working, but we're getting this flashing rainbow text. And also notice 30,719 bytes free, which is a little unusual. I'm not quite sure how the PLA can be having that effect, but clearly this is. So it's intriguing that this chip actually improved after the baking process, but it's still not completely fixed. So what mechanism could be the explanation for even any improvement? I mean, one out of all of these chips is not a great percentage, but it's something. 
Danielle, who originally alerted me to this phenomenon of possibly fixing chips with heat, sent me this link to an article about electromigration. Now I know a little bit about electromigration, and this is something that definitely causes a lot of failures in ICs, especially when they're just sitting there unused and they die. But it also is also sped up by temperature as far as I'm aware. And a lot of design considerations go into the design of integrated circuits to allow them to not suffer from premature failure from electromigration. This seems to be a blog from someone who worked in an IC manufacturing facility in Silicon Valley known as Zymos. I'm, I'm unsure of what that is, but he was a reliability technician. He says one of the most feared things about IC chips were ovens. Hundreds and even thousands were placed in chip carrier trays and put into ovens um, at temperatures as high as 150 C for days or even weeks on end, and eventually they all died. But the story doesn't end there. If I return these same dead chips back to the oven, this time without any bias, which is basically no power applied to them, after a time, they'd miraculously be restored to life. And he goes on to talk about that he thinks it's the electromigration that somehow the heat without the bias is actually reversing some of that electromigration. I'll put a link to this article so you can read it for yourself, but he kind of says that if you have a chip that kind of comes back to life uh, when you put it in the oven, you should put it back in the oven and do it for longer, and that hopefully will help restore it more. There are other failure modes on ICs, of course, besides this, that won't be reversed by this phenomenon, if this is a real thing even at that. But he seems to have said he got some success with this, and of course there's that original Atari post that um, Daniel had mentioned, which I haven't read personally, that talked about other people having success. And 100%, this number four PLA here was not working before the oven, and now it sort of works. So it, it at least partially was recovered. Now, of course, I've also been talking to Frank, AKA IZ8DWF, about this potential phenomenon and if this could actually work. And he's skeptical, as, as I was I when I first tried this. But I've already shared with him the results that one of these chips has recovered, at least partially. And he suggests that perhaps I try this in the oven again at a higher temperature and for much longer. So because I don't really have anything to lose, I'm gonna try that. I think I'm gonna do 200 degrees Celsius for two hours in the oven, and then we'll see if that PLA that got came back to life gets any better, or maybe some other chips also are revived. It's worth trying, right? Incidentally, I talked to the person I borrowed this from, and he said this oven is a kit, and it wasn't inexpensive, but um, I will put a link to the description for this particular kit, and I think there are probably other kits available at this time. So let's just uh, reposition these chips so I don't want any of them touching each other. We're gonna bake, we're gonna edit, I'm gonna turn this up to 200 C, and we're gonna do two hours. I'm gonna change this to leave oven door closed after baking, and um, don't use cooling fan. So it's just gonna slowly ramp down the temperature when this is done. And there we go, 200C for two hours, hit start. And now we wait. And it's actually the next day. These did stay in the oven for a full two hours at 200 degrees. And then whatever it took to cool, I had the door stay closed while it was cooling. So these chips have definitely been baked. Now to see, are any of them improved? Before I test any of them, let's turn on the ZIF64, make sure everything is working. Come on, RetroTank. There we go, looks good. No funny text, 38,911 bytes. I am going to remove the plankton and I'm gonna stick the number four PLA back in, if I can find it. So it seems like one side effect of 200 degree baking is that the Sharpie writing is now harder to read. You can still see the X, but the number I wrote on this chip, for instance, can't really see it. Of the PLAs, only the number five chip, it's actually hard to read. The rest are still readable. They're fainter than they were, but they're readable. So I can go right to the number four chip, which is the one that had sort of improved on the last round at 150 degrees. And I am gonna turn this on for the first time. Put your comments in the comment section below to say if this chip is any better or any worse than it was before I did the 200 degree baking. Here we go. Oh, wow, we're back to the black screen. So it actually made it worse. Now I'm just checking the connections. Definitely no pins are bent, anything like that. 
and we actually have worse. All right, so 200 degrees. That was not good. Let's try the number six chip, which was the one that worked with rainbow text from the very beginning. Let's see if it has degraded. Um, wow, well, um, this one actually appears to be working now. What? Uh, okay, I'm pretty surprised. Um, let's put the diagnostic cartridge in because this one was always failing with the diags. This is the regular diagnostic test. It would get to, oh, there we go. It's still screwed up. How funny this was working in basic and then one power cycle later and we got the rainbow text again. And it shows PLA test is bad, which is exactly how this number six chip was acting before. I never showed the diagnostic test with uh, this cartridge, but this is exactly what it does. And it will freeze up on the color RAM here. So if I pop this cartridge out and we turn it on, I assumed we're gonna see rainbow text. I, look, we got rainbow text again. So it worked one time very briefly and then it failed again. So these results are interesting. I think I just need to go through and test the rest of these chips and we'll see if any others have changed from the first time I tested them. So the results are not encouraging. Everything on this column uh, was unaffected with both the first and the second bake. That's why there's just two red dots. Down here with the ROMs, I thought there might be some changes, but there actually were no changes. I didn't have the CPU in properly when I was testing, so all of the results are exactly the same. There was a good chip, number three. I forgot if I mentioned that already. Um, it was in my dead parts bin. Obviously, that was erroneous because this worked even on my very first initial test, but it's still unchanged. So it still works. It just it didn't get worse or better. Blue screen, black screen, black screen. So yeah, really no changes between all the bakings there. The SID chips were completely unaffected by all of the baking, both rounds. And then these are the PLAs, and we had number four that actually started working by glitchy after the first bake, and it's now totally dead. There was one change in that this one right here, um, it was black screen originally, and that's uh, the first dot right there on the left. Well, this slash there means that it now does something different. Now it just gives a brown screen. So it's still not working, but it is different. So that 200 degree bake at least changed it, it didn't fix it. And then the number six chip, which was always rainbow text from the beginning, did work perfectly, which is why I put a slash there. Uh, initially it worked, and then after the second power cycle, it went back to its failure mode. Before I talk about conclusions, there is one more thing I wanted to show. Flipped upside down here are all the PLAs that I tested from one to eight. And I just wanted to show one thing that was interesting is all of these bad chips come from the Korea factory. Uh, Commodore was making chips in lots of places, Taiwan, Hong Kong, I think even the US potentially, but all of these bad ones are from Korea. So this clearly is not a big enough sample size to determine that it's all the Korean ships that are bad. In fact, I asked IZ8DWF to look at his bad PLAs. He's got three, and I think only one of his bad ones come from Korea, and the other two were from another factory. So anyways, but all of these are from 83 and 84, and that is what I have found that is this date range of PLA chip that are the most unreliable, and maybe the Korea thing has something to do with it too, but who knows? All right, time for some conclusions. Did baking chips in the toaster oven actually help? Well, according to my data, it didn't. I mean, it seems to have had some effects because we had a little bit of improvement in one chip, but then that chip actually died on the second bake, although I ramped up the temperature. It might be possible that it's Commodore's fabrication process, the way they made their chips, that doesn't respond well to the heat treatment, and that other manufacturers perhaps would. But unfortunately, I don't have enough bad chips to test that particular hypothesis. Both Daniel and I had very limited, well, basically no success in baking our chips and reviving any. So I'm not really gonna recommend that you go out and try this with your own dead chips. Of course, they're already dead, so you're not gonna lose anything by putting them in the oven, other than maybe stinking up your house and potentially contaminating the inside of your oven. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't. I'm not advocating you putting any chips in an oven you cook uh, food in. So you might want to run off to a thrift store and pick up a, a very cheap toaster oven, even one that without a fancy temperature control like this, and then just use a simple oven thermometer to figure out the internal temperature before you put your chips in there and then use your watch to time the duration. Considering how many bad Commodore chips I have, especially the fact that I have seven bad SID chips, I was really trying to be optimistic with this process to 
hoped that it would actually revive a couple of my chips. But unfortunately, as we've seen, didn't really work for me. So if you go ahead and try this process yourself and you have more success, I would love to hear about it in the comments section below. Or of course, maybe you can post a video about it yourself to show this process working to maybe help other people. But for now, I'm gonna call this particular process not effective on Commodore chips and your mileage may vary. And finally, before I end this video, I wanna thank Daniel for sending me the original idea, IZ8DWF for letting me bounce some ideas off him, and of course, Tyler here in Portland for letting me borrow his awesome temperature-controlled toaster oven modded reflow oven thingamajiggy here. So that's gonna be it. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs down button, subscribe to my channel, and hit that little notification icon if you wanna get notified on your phone when I post new videos. And finally, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. I really appreciate it when you do that. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.